good and welcome to That's Girl Speaks. Today is Thursday, December 30th, and this is episode 307. I'm Amy Beth, also known as the Fat Squirrel on Ravelry and the Fat SQRRL on Instagram. Thanks for coming over. Um, it, thank you for being patient. It's pretty cold in the house, um, so you're welcome. I made it so that you could wear your woolies and be comfortable. Um, I'm wearing a Ricky hat made out of hand spun. This is one of my favorite hat patterns. It's R-I-K-K-E using DK wool. Um, and then I am also wearing a shift shawl uh, that a friend made me that's also hand spun. Because I'm very lucky. I'm telling you, it's always a good idea to befriend hand spinners. I need a mechanic friend. Um, <laughs> need a plumber friend. But I mean, I'm really happy with my hand spinner friends because I get fancy gifts. Mm, so fancy. But anyway, I'll some grab some tea and let's chat. Did you have a nice couple of last weeks of December? Did you do something for Christmas? Did you do something for solstice? Did you do something for Hanukkah? Did you do something for anything else? I want to know about it. We went to my mom's house just for the day, um, which was very lovely. Just very relaxed. No big fanciness. I mean, my mom is a big fancy, like she's pretty fancy, but there were not fancy requirements placed upon us, which I really appreciate. I really appreciate that. But yeah, just a nice, the, you know, our teen is a teen. And so like there was a, we had to actually, I think this might be the first year that I had to wake them up for Christmas morning. Maybe last year. I don't know, but you know, there's no more getting up at 6 a.m. and like, <laughs> waiting for mom to get up. <laughs> ah, but things change and that's okay. Um, but yeah, I've just had a nice kind of slow few weeks, which I have really appreciated. Um, so this episode will contain um, a little bit of spinning, a little bit of knitting, a little bit of mending, a little bit of wood carving. I'm very confused about my hat. It feels like it's like asymmetrical and it's driving me crazy, whatever. Did you say, yes, I said wood carving. Oh, it also contained my Christmas books I bought myself. Oh, I could have brought that one over. My mother also bought me a beautiful book, but I didn't bring it over. I'll show you next time. Um, but before I get started, I should do administrativeness. Um, and the thing that I need to talk about first is um, a correction. The last time I was talk we were talking, I told you to take vitamin D. Still stands. But I made the mistake. I got confused. And I said that vitamin D is one of those that's, that you'll just pee out if you make, take too much. That's not true. It is actually fat soluble. I was thinking vitamin C, which is water soluble. So thank you so much uh, to the person who made that comment. I had gotten those confused in my brain. Um, so yes, you can definitely take too much vitamin D, and I. But you have to take quite a bit to take too much. But it is possible. So, just FYI. So I needed to correct myself. But what else do we want to talk about? Um, I think I was supposed to do so many things, and I just, I don't know. I don't want to talk about them right now. <laughs> we'll totally talk about them next time. Um, one thing I will say as you're making your winter soups. Um, did want to know, I made myself some vegetable soup this past couple of weeks. And do you, I think this might be against the rules, but I am a huge fan of putting curry powder in my vegetable soup. Right? Have you done this before? I'm not sure why, but it somehow makes it very magical. I'm just gonna switch my hat because now it's confusing me. Thanks also for not actually coming over when you come over because I haven't showered. Okay, so thanks for that. I appreciate you. <laughs> I appreciate that you come over, but don't actually come over. Um, I don't just actually, I don't just have a backup hat. This is a, a hat that I just finished. <laughs> I'm just here to show you. <laughs> I don't just carry an extra hat around with me in case one of them gets fiddly to me. Um, but yeah. That's my new favorite thing. Just a little, I mean, just enough to kind of give it a slightly different aroma. 
I don't know that, I mean, you can taste it because those two things are so tied together, but it doesn't make it taste like a curry. It just kind of adds another kind of element to it, which I really enjoy. I also made potato soup after Christmas with my, my potatoes that I grew in my garden. It was delicious. I gotta say of the things that I grew last year, I have been really pleased with my potatoes. I will not lie to you. Um, I have been resistant to growing potatoes in the past because, well, we tried them the year before last, so we just didn't get a good harvest. Um, but like part of my logical mind is like, potatoes are so cheap. Do you really want to invest money in growing them? And like that kind of like looms heavily in my brain. Like, you know, with green beans, I'm like, oh, I can't get this kind of green beans at the store. Um, with tomatoes, there is no, there's no logic in growing tomatoes either. There's quite frankly no logic in growing anything in your garden, um, except that it's enjoyable and they taste good. <laughs> there's like not a good financial return. I mean, herbs, that's a definite, like that's one. Um, but so anyway, so sometimes I struggle with that and I have to just get out of my head. I mean, what is 90% of my life? Me, she's just, just me being like, get out of your head. But I'm really struggling with this podcast today, y'all. I don't know what it is. Just low energy? What's going on? I feel like I have nothing valuable to say to you. <laughs> ah! It happens, right? Like, it just is a thing. It's okay. Um, but anyway, I have, cons I have been so pleased with my potatoes this year. Like, we're still eating potatoes. I mean, I know it's not January yet. But that's exciting to me that we're still eating them and we still have a good bunch left. Um, and like we consistently do enjoy them. I will say that like as we've gotten deeper into them, we're enjoying them more. I don't know if they kind of like improve, like some of the sugars become more developed, like as they, the starches and sugars get more developed. I don't know, but we've been enjoying them even more than when they first came out of the ground. So I highly recommend the potatoes and I will not, it's, it's kind of stressful because you can't see them growing and that is stressful. I mean, you can see the plants, but the plants don't necessarily indicate that there are actually potatoes in there or that those potatoes aren't rotting or being eaten by critters. So it is kind of this, I mean, I give them a side eye quite a lot as I walk past them over the summer. <laughs> is anything growing in there? Are you guys doing what you're supposed to do? What's going on? Uh, but I am a micromanager, sorry. But I was so enjoying them. And then of course, when you do harvest them, it's definitely a magical experience. It's pretty darn exciting. <sighs> I mean, they might actually be worth growing just for that because it is, it's like, I mean, you pay to go mine for gems, right? Like you can't eat those, just saying. Um, but yeah, so I've been enjoying soup time. It's soup season. But yeah, other than that, not a lot's going on. Which is pretty much how I like it. <laughs> but I will show you the books I bought for myself. I It started because this. I saw some artwork from this person. This is um, Angela Harding's book, A Year Unfolding, A Printmaker's View. And I love line of cut, wood cut. I love block printing styles so much. Like I just love the aesthetic of them. It's yet another thing that I have all the supplies to try to start. I've done them before, like in my early days. Like I've probably not done one for 10 or 15, years. okay, for like 20 years. <laughs> Time squishes after a while, y'all. Um, but it's an art style that I consistently love. And so I went to find her book but it was only available in the UK at the time. And so I felt like I needed to get it because A, I love all nature books, but B, I just like for inspiration, I just was really excited by the look of her artwork and like how she plays. I, anyway, I was really excited about it. So I went to buy this book and then I accidentally bought <laughs> these other ones. So sort of in the same vein, not really at all, is this book called Nests by Susan Ogilvie. It's stinking gorgeous, y'all. 
each double page is, I'm trying to pick one that you can see better, is an illustration of a nest and then information about the species that made the nest. So there's Wren, there's Dunnock, there's a Robin's Nest, there's a Song Thrush. Look at this one, so sweet, it's so tiny. Right. So it's a very quiet book with lots of negative space in it which I enjoy. I love that they do not try to jazz up the color palette at all. Like, it's really just a lot of brown and beige um, with an occasional green thrown in, maybe a gray feather here or there. Um, of course, the great tit has a slightly more colorful nest because, I mean, hi. enjoy. It gives you um, lifespan, diet, breeding season, brood position. So it's a great accompaniment to your wingspan game, which by the way, did you know that's available like on Nintendo Switch and stuff now? How cute is that? I think I need to try it. Um, but so yeah, so isn't that lovely? Oh, it's a book that I don't know that I should necessarily keep because of like like limited space of life, but it is so enjoyable to look at and so beautiful. So maybe I don't know. I don't know. The missile thrush. Right. Oh, so enjoyable. And then this is one that I have not read yet. It's England's Villages by Ben Robinson. And it's all about, well, I mean, you can imagine, but it's not just like a, it's not a um, travel writing book. It does include a lot of like information about the history of towns, um, like the, the change in town structure over time in terms of like, you know, when they did the clearances versus, you know, all these different things like lost towns. So they talk about the archeology span of some towns and it has lots of great photographs and it's just a great accompaniment to our time team love that we certainly get into around, I don't know, is it this time of year that we get into Time Team? I don't know. My husband has been very weird about not wanting to watch anything but Stargate shows lately. I don't know what's going on. I think it's like a comfort thing, like, woe the, yay these times, woe these times, low these, low these times. He's definitely in a comfort television streak, and so he really does only want to watch Stargate and Stargate Atlantis, which... I enjoy, <laughs> but I am very thankful that iPads exist <laughs> because I am not into watching them that much. Um, but I did think it would be a great accompaniment to that. So I was excited about it because mm. it talks about like, for example, well, you probably don't care because this is kind of a weird niche thing to like, but I just enjoy it. So I'm excited to read that. And then the one I have started reading is Fabric, The Hidden History of the Material World by Victoria Finley. And this one is going to be released in the U.S., but I don't think it's out yet, if I'm not mistaken. And I have enjoyed this one quite a bit. Um, it's broken into... Um, it's organized by, like, the fiber. So the first uh, chapter was about bark cloth, which... I knew what bark cloth was in its modern origins, but like this talks so much about um, cloth making in the Americas that I, I have no knowledge about. And it was very fascinating. Um, and so right now I'm on cotton, but it has wool, tweed, pashmina, sackcloth, linen, silk, imagined fabrics and imagined fabrics and patchwork. And so it's, she's an anthropologist. Her name is Victoria. She is, is she? She lives near Bath, so she is English. She's she's a white lady, um, and so it is always. Sometimes it's like a little bit, you know, just realize that she's a white lady anthropologist, and like sometimes that carries baggage with it. 
that's all I'll put out there. Uh, I'm not saying that there's anything that I have found that's specifically problematic with this book at all. Um, but, it, you know, it is always... It's an outsider looking in, and, like, that's always just... It is what it is. But I am finding it very interesting. Again, especially a lot of information. And, like... Yeah, even the section on cotton, there's been several things that I've been really, like... Wait, what? I did not know that apart about, about the, like, because, I mean, again, so much of our information, excuse me, so much of the history with cotton is tied up in larger systems. It's tied up in, obviously, systems of colonialism. It's tied up in systems of slave enslavement. It's tied up in systems of um, destructive agriculture. It's, there's, there, but it's also tied into, like, the Industrial Revolution and the increase of mechanization. Um it talks so about like I did not realize that like that there are different cottons and that some of the cottons exist in South America. Did you, I didn't know that? And so it talks, you know, it talks about cotton, not just like um, the cotton that I that my clothing is made of now, but like other forms of cotton that have existed and how those are used versus how um, gypsum hers. Utum. By the way, it's hilarious. Last time, well, it's not hilarious. That's clearly hyperbole. hyperbole. Uh, but it is entertaining to me. The last time we talked, I talked about Rubio's tea. And some of you were like, do you mean rooibos tea? And I was like, yeah, I don't know how to spell, I don't know how to pronounce things. Because I mean, like, that is one of those things where you're like, dude, I've never heard anybody say that word. I've only seen it on a package. But the funny thing is, if you would have asked me, I would have 100% sworn that it was spelled R-O-O-B-I-O-S because my brain just like put the I in the wrong place at some point in learning the name of that T. It's weird how brains work, right? <laughs> but so I am excited about this one. So yeah, those are my book treats. And I'll show you my new um, Yoko Seito book because I'm excited about that one too, but I'll show you that next time. Um, spinning. Uh, I did. I am currently spinning on my uh, base 12 spin along with hip strings. So I have one bobbin done and I have, I'm spinning one day and I have one day left. So I definitely, I did really good the first six days and then I got sidetracked or something. Life, you know. So I'm working on that. I'm excited to have that yarn to show you next time. Um, let's do finished objects. So this is a finished object. <laughs> so this is my thermal hat. Thermal is a free pattern put out by Green Mountain Spinnery, I believe. Um, and it is what it's like, I think it's my favorite fingering weight hat. I have one um, that it's gold, and now I have this lovely green. Both of them are Madeline Tosh, the one without nylon, the one that's just superwash merino. Um, I cast mine on with zeros. This one I didn't work as far into the brim on zeros before I switched to US one and a halfs. Um, but I do like the way the other one, I should have worked it a little bit longer on zeros, but I was just lazy apparently. But I love this hat. I love a hat that stays on my head, but is not ribbed. Um, you see the other one I love is also garter stitch. I love garter stitch for a hat. Um, it is one of my favorites. I need to make you a garter stitch in the round video. I have one out there that's about doing wrap and turns in the round. You can see this seam. Um, but this one I used, I worked using um, German short rows in the round. And it is slightly less visible. The seam is right there. It's actually pretty good about being invisible. Boop, 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 boop. So yeah. And I wasn't, I'm not particularly, like things like that being invisible don't bother me. So I'm not particularly careful about tension and things. So um, I do think the German short row method makes a slightly more invisible um, short or German short row method for no pearl garter in the round is slightly better. 
um, for the look of it. I also like the fact that unlike when you're doing wraps and turns, when you're doing wraps and turns, you almost don't want to have the beginning of the row um, Like if it's it's fine when you're using like a 16 inch circ, but if you magic loop, it's a pain because you don't want them on like the either end, like where your cable is going to come out because when you have to wrap and turn, you don't want to have to keep wrapping and turning over that join. Um, but then also like if you put it in the in the um, middle of a section on magic loop, then you're then you're turning your yarn and needles a lot more than you would otherwise have to, which is a bit annoying and slows you down. So the nice thing about doing the um, the German short road method is that that's not as much, that's really not a factor at all, putting the join on, on the ends. But still, 16 inch circs are better for efficiency when doing a hat. I think, for me, whatever you would do works for you. So that's a finished object. I also finished... I'm going to show you a worn sock, but you can't tell that it's been worn. I just wore it on Christmas Day. I finished my um, Advent yarn that I purchased from Woolens and Nosh. I have an imperfect skein. So you'll see right here, there's not a white stripe between two stripes. So I purchased a discounted skein. Um, and she also changed like the order of a stripe somewhere. But I did finish mine. I did knit more than a stripe a day because uh, I have big feet. <laughs> so this is her 90% super, Superwash Tarhi 10% Nylon, which is one of my favorite sock bases. Um, but I've been noticing that I'm having a bit more pilling in those socks than I would really like. So I decided to go down to a double zero for these. I usually knit my socks on a zero. So we'll see how they wear. Um, I will let you know if they wear better. I think they're going to. But with going down to a double zero, I also switched. I'm usually a 72 stitch sock person. I went up to 76 stitches and I love the way they fit. Um, when I do an afterthought heel, I have a very wide foot. Well, I have a very wide foot, but I also have a chonky foot along my ankle. I have a very Fred Flintstone-y kind of foot. So I work 10 rounds before I start my heel decreases. Um, I do leave my heel pretty broad because again, Fred Flintstone foot. This fits my foot perfectly. Um, so yeah, I mean, I like a heel flap, but I'm just as happy to knit these. And the great thing about doing um, an afterthought heel is that you don't have to purl anything because it's knit in the round. You knit it just like a toe. So yeah, they're super cute. I really, I just really dig them. They're very fun. Oh, did I bring those over? Oh, I did, okay. So I finished those, yay! That was very fun. She sent the, she sent like two wound balls in like a little canvas bag that had a snap on it. And so you could, you didn't, nest, and because of the white stripe between the two stripes, you couldn't see the next stripe. You just knit until the white started to show. So it's very cute and I really did enjoy it. I didn't, I've never done that before. And I don't, I know that I have knit two at a time socks, but I mean, or I've knit both socks at a time. Meaning I didn't put them on the same like cirque is what I'm trying to say. But like I've knit them. I mean, I think I've done that too. But this time I really enjoyed it. I don't know what it was. But I really enjoyed knitting like a little bit on one sock and then a little bit on the other. It was very pleasant. And I knit them on double zeros on carbons. Um, and I think I might try that experience again. I'm not usually one. Like I don't like to put my yarn through like grommets or anything in bags, like to keep balls separated. That's never been my jam. Um, but I did like having those little cakes inside a bag that had a snap in the middle so they were divided. Um, I don't know, that was, it was very tidy. Nothing got tangled up. Cause you just like flip flop your bag around if you needed to. I really liked it. I'd, what I would do is just knit on them each morning and like I would knit them and then play the New York Times spelling bee game. Um, and so it was nice to have like a contemplative thing and while I was knitting on my socks, it was just very pleasant. So yeah, I could definitely see doing another self-striping um, for a countdown calendar 
of some sort for a birthday or for solstice maybe. That'd be fun to do one for summer solstice because I don't actually really like summer solstice. Even though I should, right? Like that's actually the one I should like the most because that's the one that like, okay, the sun is going away. So that's actually the trajectory that I like. I get a little mournful on the winter one because I'm like, oh, but the sun's coming back. No, I need another little bit of water time. Um, but yeah, maybe I should do a countdown for something else. Maybe I should do like a January count along or a March one. Yeah, whatever. Anyway, it was fun. I enjoyed it. Okay, there's that. And then I did show you last time that I was knitting on some socks. This is Nomadic Yarns, and this is one of her mistletoe colorways. And the pattern that what I'm doing for mine is on the first complete, like on the first, as soon as your stripe changes, you start doing knit two, slip one around. So you do need a multiple of three stitches. Um, I mean, you don't have to, but it does make life easier. <laughs> so for example, if you do a 72 stitch sock, it works quite well. Um, so you do knit two, slip one for that first full round of the color change, and then you go on. And it gives you a fun, I've done ones before where the slip stitch was always like in the same column. And so it makes it look a little bit more like a distinct pattern. Um, but I like the way this is just kind of shimmery looking. It, like it has good movement to it. Um, so yeah, and then somebody suggested very smartly that if you are gonna do an afterthought, that you either put in a rip cord. So like you, you know what I mean, right? Like you knit your socks onto like a waist yarn and then you just slide that back and then knit over it or that you knit that stripe plain, and you are 100% right, thank you. <laughs> it was funny because before I read your message, I was like, hmm, I wonder if that's gonna be a problem. I'm sure it'll be fine. It's a pain. So like on these, I have like, I had to cut like multiple, I don't even understand mathematically why I had to cut more than one yarn. Like, it was very weird. I don't, I, I don't really understand what happened. <laughs> like I get the slipping of stitches, but I guess what I don't, th what I'm not thinking about is like the other side of the slip stitches. Like I'm thinking about the side that where I like what I would rip apart, like that side. I'm not thinking what the other side looks like. And so that's where the problem was, but it's fine. It's totally fine. But if you don't want to have a cur or cur a kerfluffle and you don't want your brain to hurt a little bit then you should put in a rip cord <laughs> or again knit that stripe plane if you're gonna do some slip stitch socks patterning <laughs> it's like I was listening to what was I listening to I was listening oh maybe it was this book so I wasn't listening I was reading I was reading this book talk about the invention of I'm like where did that information come from Duh, the book I just talked about talking about the invention of the spinning Jenny and like the concept of like putting a spinning wheel on its like flipping it so that it's on its back essentially um and that's like how the thought process of developing a spinning Jenny kind of came about in one iteration of it and like this moment of me trying to read it and then being like wait, I actually don't really understand how a spinning wheel works. Like I know, like I know how to use one, like the telephone. I know how to use one. I don't know how it works. <laughs> I had this like intense moment of like, wait, I don't actually understand how the flyer moves independently of the wheel. And then like the, I just had like a whole like, brain melty moment of just being like, you know what? Never mind. I'm fine. I know how to operate it. <laughs> this is how we become that industry, that planet on Star Trek or I don't know which sci-fi, I'm sure more, more than one sci-fi um, iteration has happened of the people who have all the technology, but don't know how to fix anything because 
they don't know how anything works because their ancestors made this technology and then they just never managed to learn how it worked and so they're just it's all death it's like all decaying around them i'm part of the problem y'all part of the problem <laughs> whatever i gotta learn this carve a spoon i can't know exactly how everything works <laughs> So there's that. What else am I doing? Um, I started a hat. I'm not even going to say this hat's for my husband. I started a hat. It would be great if my husband would wear. If not, it goes in the donation pile. No biggie. I have a very particular hat wearing husband. So I'm kind of modeling it after um, the, is it the 1898 hat? But also, like, I just did um, a hand-spun hat where you knit the brim and you fold it. So it's really more like that one from Spin Off. Um, and you fold it up, and then you cast on this side and make a crown. And then you ca you pick up for this, cast on, you pick up this side, make a crown, pick up this side, make a crown. This will eventually be a tube. Doop, I'll graft it together. Um, and then you have a double layer hat that is hopefully perfectly sitting on top of his ears. I just watched, I just watched his work hat, which is made of beaver slide dry goods. Um, and it's, it's at this point, it's two different colors. Like it's a different color on the inside than it is on the outside because it's like five or six years old, maybe minimum. And like it's just become faded from the sun. It's it's not in any way the dyeing because it's just it's actually held up amazingly well for a merino yarn that he wears every day during the winter. And then touches with like his very dirty car hands that he like does stuff to cars. He inspects cars and stuff. And so like then he like he's like it's, so it's so I actually had to take the vegetable brush to it to like try to get off the like top layer of grime. And he was like, oh, wow, my hat's a different color now. I was like, yeah. <laughs> it's not the color of dirt. <laughs> so anyway, we'll see how it goes. This is um, Cascade Eco Wool. I think this is technically called Eco Plus or something. Um, but it is a bulky. Yeah, sometimes they consider it Aran, but it's a really nice texture. It has, it's a pretty warm wool for its weight. It's not woolen spun, but it, it has sort of, it feels almost like an in-between, like an in-between of worsted and woolen spun. And that might just be because of the plying. It has a pretty soft ply. Um, but so yeah, we'll see how that goes. But it's it's cool. I have a, a, a pile that's going to go out here in a month or so. So it'll just go in that pile. No strings attached to this hat. But then I also cast on, is it the, is it Musselboro? It's the Isolde Teague hat where you, it's really quite lovely. You get to start at the top. Yes, clear my search history, please. Thank you. Musselberg, going with Musselberg. It's probably Musselboro. Whatever. <laughs> It's M-U-S-S-E-L-B-U-R-G-H. It's by Isolde Teague. And it's basically a hat pattern where you can do anything from seven to four and a half stitches to inch. And it's sized from baby to adult extra large. And you get to cast on at the crown. So you don't have to know your gauge when you start. You just knit an increasing pattern, measure your gauge, and then that from that, it'll tell you depending on your size, how much you have to increase. And then you knit like a big tube and then you close it up down here and then you bloop it inside each other. And so you have a double layer hat. Um, and this is Nomadic Yarns and this is her yak base. And so I don't think I've ever knit with a yak base sock yarn. Um, it is it's super wash merino yak. But it is definitely a very skinny yarn, at least before blocking. And so I wanted to knit a hat that I didn't have to worry about the gauge being particularly tight. Because I am knitting this on 
US one and a half, and it is producing a very loose gauge. I am a loose knitter anyway, but I wanted, so that's, seeing how skinny the yarn was made me really think, okay, I need to make this, for this to be a functional hat for me, I'm gonna need to make it two layers. So, and I've been wanting to try that hat, so it's perfect. It's a great hat pattern. Again, if you're trying out a yarn that's new to you, um, or you just don't knit a lot of hats and you're not sure what your gauge is going to be. It's pretty cool. I enjoy it. And I've actually been enjoying just knitting this stockinette in the round. Lots of times I get frustrated with it, but I mean just in general, like knitting a sweater or whatever. Um, but I think because it is a shorter round and the addition of self-striping really helps to make it a little bit more pleasant to knit on. And the loose gauge probably. It is easier to knit at a looser gauge. So yeah, I'm very pleased with it. And it's one of her Christmas colorways. I don't know what it is. So that is all of my knitting. I did do some pack. Oh, you wanna see my spoon so far? Okay, I totally confess that I asked for this spoon carving set of knives, uh, like two, three Christmases ago. My parents were lovely and got me them and then they sat in the cabinet because I was just too intimidated. <laughs> like, unlike fibery things where I feel like I, like, even when I started to spin, like, yes, I had no idea how to spin. But I did know about yarn. And I didn't just know, like, that yarn was a thing. Like, I had an intimate acquaintance with yarn. Like, I knew what twist was. I knew how it affected yarn. I knew what wool was. I knew what different types of wool were. But like s carving, I know, I don't even know how to hold a knife. I mean, I know how to hold like a chef's knife, but I don't know how to hold a knife to carve something or to whittle something. I'm really a whittler, I'm not a carver. Um, the, I don't, I'm, just, I'm an Appalachian person. <laughs> um, so I was just super intimidated to start. Like I, and I couldn't find, a video that really, I, I usually like to learn from books, but so I had, so thank you for waiting. Gus was having a fit at the UPS band. Um, so like, and also like another, like just like the headspace of like getting different stuff out. Like I was like, okay, I've got to have a place that this is a messy thing. There's going to be like wood shavings and wood chips everywhere. Like I had to figure out like where that was going to be and like, that's a whole set like it's just like before I started sewing for a job like getting a machine out and like getting a cutting thing out and getting those tools out and finding this and finding that was always just a hurdle to me starting to sew anything so it's like that combined with the fact that I just became completely overwhelmed with my my intense beginnerness But I'd been wanting to try it and it's perfect time over the holiday for me it was a great time. I had a little bit of extra time where I could fiddle around a bit and that kind of thing. I didn't have to have sewing out. So, although I did have sewing out because I made overalls. I'll show you next time. This is me trying to remember to do that. Um, <laughs> but my set, my knife set has, it's from Beavercraft, I want to say. Like it was totally from Amazon, you know. And it's like in this little very durable canvasy case, which does really feel like bulletproof. And it has these three tools in it, which seem to be perfectly exactly what I need. Um, this little thing though, this hook tool, I do not get how it works yet. I'm, look at me, I'm, I'm looking at you hook tool. These I pretty much get. <laughs> but anyway, so I finally found a YouTube video um, that f I felt like I could understand. He wasn't telling me like how to hold the knives and things like that, but I could see clearly how he was holding the knife and how he was manipulating the piece of wood that he was working on. And he did talk a little bit about like grain and like how the, like how carving on the grain versus against the grain, like that kind of works out, which helps me a lot. Um, but so here's my spoon so far. It's definitely not a spoon yet, but it it's in a spoonish kind of family. And I can see how this is, this could be an addictive thing. 
Like, you know what I mean? Like when you have a jigsaw puzzle out, you're just like, oh, I'll just put one piece in. And then you're like, three hours later, you're like, what happened? I could definitely see that would happen with this. Except I will say, <laughs> I worked on this um, on the day after Christmas. And in the middle of the night, like at three o'clock in the morning, I went up, oh, I woke up to go to the bathroom. And like, as soon as I woke up, I was like, oh, ah, what is, what's wrong with my shoulder? And I was trying to think like, did I fall? Did I like run into something? Like what on earth did I do? And then it occurred to me, it was from carving. <laughs> I was so concerned about like not chopping my finger off, which is important. Um, I was, I guess I was probably just really like tense because it also takes quite a bit of hand strength, which I do have a lot of hand strength, but it's different. It's still different. And I was probably just tense overall because I was less confident. Um, but I woke up and was like, <laughs> so I had to take a few days off. Um, but I could definitely see how this could be an addictive thing to do, especially I'm excited about, I want to become more comfortable with it and more comfortable with using the knives um, because it would be super awesome when you're outside, like in, like when you're camping or just when you're outside, just without anything. Like I, I struggle to not have something to do. I mean, I know you understand, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't always want to knit. Um, I know sacrilege, right? Like it, that's deep sacrilege, but it's true. Um, and so like drop spindling is a great option, but I thought this would be a great Again, it's another thing that humidity wouldn't matter as much. It wouldn't be as problematic if I was hot or what have you. So, yeah, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. It was very fun to do this handle part so far. I need to take it down further, obviously. But because you got to, like, peel off, like, really giant, like, curly strips of wood. And I was like, dude, I could totally just see that being a pleasant thing to do and, like, have nothing at the end. But just to, like, peel off the wood was, like... I could definitely get into that. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed it. And I, I don't know, we'll see. Easier probably to pick up than banjo, which I'm still, it's still staring at me from the corner. I don't know, I need to download the uh, learning, the no, I know how to play a banjo app <laughs> into my brain. Ah, I want to learn all the things. But I know you can empathize, right? Are you learning anything new? You don't have to. Enjoy the things you know how to do. But I hope you are um, enjoying. Um, see, I'm already like, I just need to take off this little piece right here. <laughs> Put it down. You need to rest your shoulder. Uh, but are you excited about a new thing? Are you excited about an old thing? Are you excited about an old thing that is that you're working on again? Um, an old thing that I was working on again is I made this quilt for myself last fall. I want to say, I don't know. I made, I'm making that up, but it was from a flannel layer, layer cake. And I used, um, the layer cake, like papers, like the foundation papers. But I don't know. This is the only quilt that I've really had this trouble with is I had a bunch of seams like where the flannel frayed into the seam and it like came open essentially, but it's not like the stitching failed. It was like the flannel. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's because like I didn't quilt it as closely as I've quilted other things. Um, and it does, my mom agreed that flannel does fray quite easily, but I was still really surprised that that happened. And because it's foundation pe paper piecing, it's very possible that when I cut the pieces, like I may have cut a seam allowance too short um, and maybe like if I do a flannel quilt in the, in the future, I need to make a three ace or excuse me. Um, yeah, like a three ace seam allowance instead of just a quarter. I don't know, but that is all to say that I've been putting off patching my quilt forever, but I actually went ahead and did my patching. So I'm very proud of myself. Um, you can see, I used some wool scraps from bags that I made for y'all. Um, so those I did on my machine, but then I also wanted to practice doing needle turns, and these are just squares, so they're not fancy. But I wanna do some needle turn applique, and so I thought, oh, this would be a great place to, to practice 
doing that. So some of my patches are needle print applique. Um, but yeah. So I'm very proud of myself that I mended my blanket. <laughs> and now I can wash it without fear of my wool batting coming out, which would be very sad. But I love my wool blanket. Um, it is just the batting is wool. Uh, again, the exterior is flannel. But I tell you what, wool batting, I'm telling you, wool, team wool all the way. Um, I might even next year, if I'm going to make it, I'm, I need to make one for my husband because he loves electric blankets, but it seems like the last few we have bought have failed, like, after just, like, 18 months. And I cannot justify purchasing them for that. Um... So I'm thinking about, I might make him one that is actually all wool so that it's, and it may not be actually like pieced in a pretty way. It might just be like two layer, like a top wool, bottom wool, and a wool batting, and then just, you know, tied or something or, or quilted, but I may not piece it because I don't know if I want to piece wool. Um, but yeah, I think I might try that because I tell you what, it makes such a difference to have a wool batting over to have over having a cotton batting. It's so nice. But yeah. I think that's all. I have another project that I need to start on. My mom gave me this panel um, and, and the coordinating fabrics. And aren't they just darling? And then it has like a re larger rectangle and then it's got hedgies and a squirrel. Right? And this running rabbit. Oh, rabbits, excuse me. So that's something I need to do. She gave it to me so that I could make a quilt um, for my dining room window. So that's something I need to do in the future. Oh, I have so many things I want to do. Oh, so many fun things. Sometimes it's hard to walk that line between like Oh, I want to do this because it's fun and then like being like I want to do this because now I bought the supplies for it and I feel like I must do it do you get in that place <sighs> I tell you if I just weren't so aspirational maybe I wouldn't buy so many supplies and then I would be less stressed out about it but does the self who buys the supplies ever listen to the future self who's like um now I'm stressed out no she doesn't listen to her mm. I hope you are enjoying your entry to cold times if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. It's been very rainy and just kind of like bleh here. That's not too uncommon for us. I mean, rain is not as common in the winter, but it's still pretty common. I will confess that I'm very envious of seeing, oh, did you enjoy Vlogmases? I need to be a person who does Vlogmas. We could just like hang out and card wool or something, right? Like it doesn't have to be fancy. We should totally do that next year. We could do it. I could just like do basics. It wouldn't be fancy. It would not be pretty probably. <laughs> be like the bootleg vlog vlogmas, but <laughs> we could card wool and make potato soup, right? It's something we do. Um, but I was so, I loved seeing people who have like snow on the ground and then who might actually potentially have snow on the ground all year. Actually, I don't know that I watched anybody's vlog once who did that. I was just watching a video tube, video tube, <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> you know that video tube app? It's real popular with the kids these days. <laughs> but so I, I had this like, a, like I, I watch White Christmas. Is that what it's called? Every, I, I don't like any classic movies. I don't like musicals generally. I don't know what it is about that stupid movie, but it is very comforting to me in all of its ridiculousness. But, um, but then this year I also had to add in Grumpy Old Men. Who am I? That movie was made when I was like in high school. I think I just want to watch shows where there's snow. <laughs> this realization like where it's cold I'm like I just want to watch places that are that's cold because it's not cold here is that what I'm doing I don't know what's wrong with me y'all I mean I do know many things that are wrong with me <laughs> okay 
like, I should stop talking. Just hush me up. I know you're trying, you're like at the door, you're like going to the door and then I like pull you back in and you're like, I'm like I gotta go. Get out of my house, it's fine. It's fine, you just gotta go. I will come back to you next time. Maybe I'll be slightly more with it. Maybe I will. I don't know for sure. Um, but we will definitely have more knitting and I have sewing to show you. I finished a pair of dungarees. Um, I might have a test sew to show you. It might be released by then. I'm not sure. But yeah, I need to make some more corduroy. I did make one pair of corduroy pants, which were not particularly successful, but I'll show you those. And then hopefully I'll have another good pair by then. We'll see. Thanks for coming over. I'll see you in the new year.